let's imagine that you've done perhaps 12 weeks of let's say continuous training and fart leg training and maybe you've combined it with some other stuff whether it's strength or interval or here or whatever it happens to be but you've done this aerobic work right what are going to be the differences because you have done that work and i want to address four groupings of changes or physiological ad adaptations we are going to talk about cardiovascular if i can spell it correctly it always helps cardiovascular adaptation so what has changed to your heart what has changed to your blood vessels what has changed in the blood itself we are going to address respiratory adaptations what has changed with regard to the performance of your lungs of respiratory muscles and so on in that particular environment we're going to look at what has changed in your muscular environment what is the actual muscular structure and how has it changed and we're also going to have a look at the metabolic changes in your system and metabolic uh, metabolism of course is the sum total of all chemical reactions in the body so what is actually reacting differently that's changed because of this work that we've done so let's do that and let's immediately consider this cardiovascular type factor okay we start doing or we complete this 12 weeks training program we're much fitter we're leaner we're lighter we're doing all those sort of things but what is changing in our heart and i'm going to link and try and explain some of these points to you but the first thing is we get an up arrow an increase in heart strength now that's a nice simple point we could also say that we get myocardial hypertrophy myo meaning muscle cardial meaning heart hypertrophy meaning fattening increasing in size hypertrophy is the opposite of atrophy which is the shrinking of now that's all fine we can say the left ventricular wall goes through myocardial hypertrophy lovely but the point i really want to make here is that what that causes is that we get an increase in stroke volume and specifically here we get an increase in both resting stroke volume but also in maximal uh, exercise stroke volume as well and that is the impact of this and that's the point i want to make folks what are the impacts of these particular things this on other aspects of biology but also on our performance itself so if we get an, a greater stroke volume what else does that mean especially if we think about it at rest well we get a decreased resting heart rate because decreased resting heart rate and this happens of course because our base equation is cardiac, uh, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate so of course if stroke volume is greater at rest that means we need fewer heartbeats at rest therefore our resting heart rate goes down now what impact does this have and this is where i believe and i don't know if you want to feel the same this is where for me it gets kind of exciting you get an increased exercising exercising heart rate range exercising hr range so if your resting heart rate is lower perhaps you're bradycardic less than 60 beats per minute that means that the total additional heartbeats you've got remaining available to you during exercise before you reach maximum is far greater which means that you have a more efficient cardiovascular system so there's some of our impacts because of everything i said we get an increased we get an increased maximal maximal q and specifically q dot remember q dot is cardiac output we've got a greater cardiac output during maximal exercise now what does that mean we're going to have a look at the metabolic sort of factors in a second but what this means if i do another one of those my little dodgy uh, orange lines this means that we can work at higher intensity at higher intensity for longer without fatigue okay now of course that's going to have impact that we can make more uh, high intensity sprints it means that we can play let's say uh, d to d in basketball it means that we can uh, maintain a higher pace without producing lactic acid they they're all outputs of this we also have other factors we have up arrow more blood plasma so we have more of the fluid of the blood of course it's where we find the suspension of all kinds of nutrients we also have an up arrow in what we describe as red blood cell count so we have more red blood cells in the blood typically about 45 percent for the average person by the way you can call this if you want to the hematocrit hematocrit that's what red blood cell count that's his technical term and of course if you've got a greater amount of red blood cells you have an increased o2 carrying capacity again what is the object what is the impact of that that means that we can do higher intensity work aerobically and produce fewer byproducts therefore not leading to fatigue increase oxygen carrying capacity it also means that we have got 
better removal, better removal of waste. Okay, because of course we oxidize lactic acid. We also use red blood cells to remove CO2. So we're better able to remove that, that waste. Let's go a bit further. We could also stress here um, that we've got better capacity for transporting fats. So uh, capacity for transporting, for example, soluble fats. And it's other nutrients as well. If I put up arrow, better capacity. That's of course part of that blood plasma point I made before. We can actually carry more glycerol, more fatty acids um, in the blood that have been absorbed in the small intestine. This of course is of great benefit and we can use those uh, uh, in aerobic respiration as well. But we also get, we also get increased up arrow strength of smooth muscle in blood vessels in vessels so for example our venous return mechanism of this of the smooth muscle becomes more efficient we also get although these do start to flirt with the other areas here we also get capillarization and of course we get more capillaries at both the alveoli and at the muscle that's a vascular consideration and that's useful as well because of course now we've got a greater exchange area for diffusion therefore we can uh, exchange more co2 and oxygen at the relevant place and therefore we're more efficient as a result so there's our cardiovascular but can you please take out from that for me that i am repeatedly talking about the impact of these adaptations so let's go further let's now have a look at our respiratory factors okay things through the, the the lungs the respiratory muscles what changes here and the big takeaway point i want to make here is up arrow increased strength of respiratory muscles so that's the really big takeaway here our respiratory muscles get stronger think about your uh, diaphragm your external internal intercostal muscles pectoralis minor the abdominals for expiration we could be talking uh, as well about sternocleidomastoid and scalenes etc they get stronger what's the impact of that it means that we can draw a more forceful deeper inspiration a more forceful expiration getting more air in and out of our system so that's really really positive that means duck 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 we get an increased lung capacity, not because the lungs get better, uh, sorry, bigger, but because we've got the actual muscles powering the air coming in with more force. Therefore, we get an up arrow, an increase in tidal volume. One of the impacts of that increasing tidal volume is duh, 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 we get a decrease in breathing frequency at rest. Which means, if I go into exactly the same principle we talked about before, duh, 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 we've now got an increased breathing frequency range for exercise. Breathing frequency range. So because we are breathing less at rest, it means that we've got more breaths available during that, those exercise conditions. That's really, really powerful. We also get an increased rate of diffusion that's partly because of the capillarization i meant i mentioned before but we're now actually um, consuming more or actually taking in more oxygen from the outside environment of course we can deliver that to the working muscle we can do that aerobically therefore we're not producing lactic acid therefore we can go higher intensity for longer without fatigue the impact are these ones okay and there's so much that it's kind of hard to write everything down for you but these are important ones for you to be aware of and i'll just mention again we get capillarization and of course in terms of the respiratory structures we're interested there at the alveoli okay the collective alveoli now there's our respiratory uh, factors and they are impacting on performance let's go a stage further we're now interested in muscular and you'll be pleased to know that these get fewer and fewer as we go through these different subgroupings but with muscular we get the following things. We get an increase in size of mitochondria. That's an E. <laughs> of my so these aerobic factories in the muscle cells, these organelles, they get bigger. And that means we're capable of more aerobic respiration. We also get up arrow an increased density of mitochondria. So not only are mitochondria bigger, but there's more of these flipping things. And they are where aerobic energy release occurs, the only place. And therefore, we do more work aerobically. Wonderful, wonderful. We also get an up arrow increase in myoglobin stores. Up arrow in increase in myoglobin stores. Myoglobin, of course, is the substance within the muscles, muscle fibers, which both transports but also stores oxygen. We get an increase 
in glycogen stores. Now this is really important because of course this glycogen store is going to be the source or at least one of the sources of aerobic respiration. The more glycogen there is, the more aerobic capacity we have in the later stages of let's say a marathon run, for example. But we're also getting increased fat stores. Now you might be thinking, hang on a second, what do you mean by that? Well of course fat here, we're talking about fat as the energy source. That's a positive thing and we can utilize that during performance. And then finally, we get an increased proportion, up arrow proportion of SO fibers. You know, remember these slow oxidative type one fibers. And of course, these are fatigue resistant. They have a high aerobic capacity. Again, reflect on the impact. If we take these SO fibers as our examples, can you see here, we can do a more aerobic work efficiently. We can work at higher intensities aerobically. We can go longer before we fatigue. We can do higher intensity work without producing lactic acid, it is an impact factor we're looking for. And finally, and thank you for bearing with me, I know it's a bit of a long one, we want to have a look at metabolic adaptations. Now with metabolic, the sum total of all chemical reactions in the body, we are talking about, for example, an increase in enzyme activity. If, for example, our PFK is becoming more and more efficient in the breakdown of glycogen through the process of glycolysis, that's going to release more energy for us and therefore we can do more aerobic work efficiently, do less anaerobic work. Wonderful. We get an increase in the buffering capacity. Be reminded that buffering is the removal of, uh, lact uh, of hydrogen ions from lactic acid in the presence of the bicarbonate ion. Okay, so it, it buffers it away. If we get better at that, we're better efficient at, at um, uh, removing lactic acid, and therefore we're less likely to achieve obla. We also get reduced fat mass. Now, I know we said before that we can store more fat, or we're more efficient at storing fat, but also we get lighter, of course, by definition. Next point, I've kind of touched on this one already, we're very nearly there. We can delay obla. Remember, obla is the onset of blood lactate accumulation. If we can buffer lactic acid away, if we've got greater enzyme activity, if we've got greater stores of glycogen, there's less obla, or there's less lactic acid to be produced, therefore we don't reach obla, we de delay obla. We also get a down arrow decrease in insulin resistance. Really important insulin, of course, being presented from the pancreas down into the small intestine. And finally, very last point for today, we also get an increased capacity to oxidize fat. Okay, so we can use fats more efficiently at higher intensities of exercise, but again at lower intensities where they're specialized for. So all of these factors have an impact, and that is really where I want you to place your emphasis, not only to learn these adaptations, but how they impact performance. Thanks.